All right, welcome to chapter 20 in Business Law 2. And I am going to cover in this particular chapter, corporations. And we're gonna look at what corporations are involved, how they are, what sorts of protections they have and what sorts of rights they have. Then we're gonna look a little bit at corporate formation and governance and what the duties of various officers and directors and shareholders have. And then towards the end of the chapter, we're going to look at how corporations can combine together and uh, how they can merge and then ultimately how they terminate their lifespan. And so we're gonna look at all of those wonderful topics in this exciting action-packed chapter of business law. So let's get to it. So corporation, well, a corporation is a creature of state statute. And so we're not looking at any kind of federal law here. This is a state level law, which means you're going to get a little bit of variation, right? You're going to get variation between Wisconsin and Illinois or Ohio or wherever you're from. And so that means that you need to check into what the options are in your state. Now, that being said, most corporate law is pretty well settled at this point. And the states, while they do offer some variation between the states, generally are uh, about the same in terms of the way that they handle the general things that we're going to talk about in business law. So, some of the differences are you'll see a lot of corporations that are formed in Delaware, for example. A matter of fact, most corporations are incorporated in Delaware. And the modern trend is for them to be incorporated in Nevada. And you say, what would Delaware and Nevada logically have to do with where I'm going to form my national corporation? Well, Delaware had for many years some of the tightest privacy protections for owners and directors of corporate boards. And so everybody wanted to file in Delaware. In fact, there was a time when it seemed that there were more corporations formed in Delaware than there were people in the state of Delaware. And so even though it's a small state population wise, it is a powerhouse when it comes to America's corporations and they kind of deliberately made themselves a haven for corporations, very favorable laws and protections that were in place. Well, Nevada decided, you know what, let's give Delaware some competition. And so Nevada did two things. Number one, they pretty much copied all of the privacy protections that Delaware was offering, and they have Las Vegas. And so they said, hey, if you incorporate in, Del in Delaware, you have to go to Delaware for your annual meeting. Blah. Who wants to go to Delaware? They said, come incorporate in Nevada and you can have your corporate retreats and your corporate board meetings and shareholder meetings in wonderful Las Vegas, right? And so everybody wants to go to Vegas. And uh, so that was one of the reasons why there was a big boom. And now a lot of corporations are actually formed in Nevada. So it's a creature of state statute. Now, what's interesting is that when a corporation is created, legally speaking, we say that the corporation has become a legal person. I don't know why we do that. I guess it's another one of those business law things where we take a normal word and we twist it to mean things that it doesn't mean to normal people. Uh, but the word person normally means someone who's kind of walking around and talking and so forth. And in this case, that's not what it means at all. Person status in the law gives a corporation rights that normally we would associate with an individual. So we're going to, over the next few slides, we're going to look at some of those rights that corporations have. So we often talk about the shares of stock. And so a corporation is owned by a shareholder or more than one shareholder. You have to have at least one. That's the stockholders. Now, a corporation is an artificial person. And one of the most significant ramifications of that person status is the fact that the corporation has constitutional rights. And so if it has constitutional rights, then that means that uh, it has the right to be represented by counsel. It has the right to equal protection under the law. It has the right to access to the courts. And one of the greatest rights that a corporation has is the right to be sued. The right to be sued. Now, if we were all sitting in class together, I would at this point stop my lecture and I would ask you a question. 
I would say to you, why in the world would we say that that is a good thing that a corporation can be sued? Why would anybody be happy about getting sued? Oh, look, to open the mail, get some paperwork today. Oh, look, this is great news. We've been sued. Okay, nobody ever said that, right? Uh, nobody wants to get sued. That's not normally a good thing, right? So in your mind, since I can't hear you, all right, uh, in your mind, why would it be a good thing that a corporation can be sued? Hmm. Well, thank you for asking. The answer is, if the corporation is getting sued, you aren't. The greatest point of a corporation, and we actually studied this in Law 1, if you think way back to that, when we talked about business entities, the greatest thing about a corporation is that it gets sued for corporate liabilities and the owners don't. If we were talking about a partnership, if we were talking about a sole proprietorship, we would be saying, oh, you know, someone slipped and fell in the parking lot, you're getting sued. What's on the line with that? Your house, your car, your boat. I don't have a boat. If I had a boat, it'd be on the line, right? And so your personal assets are at stake. But in a corporation mode, the corporation is now a person, and that person is what gets sued. Not only does the corporation have the right to get sued, it has the right to sue and to file suit on its own behalf. And so in the name of the corporation, you can go to court and file a lawsuit with the named party being the corporation. It has the right to due process. We studied these constitutional rights last semester, the right to due process before anything is denied. It's property rights. It has the right to own property and to have those rights enforced by a court of law. So those are some of the constitutional rights that a corporation has. Now, it also has some criminal law protections. For example, the Fourth Amendment applies to corporations. So the corporation in its own name can defend the privacy of its own records from unreasonable searches and seizures. This would include electronic records. This would include location data. These are some interesting cases that you might find uh, if you were so given such a, a task, uh, such an assignment to go out and find an article. You might find an article about a corporation who was defending itself from a government request for records. Now, can the government ask nicely for the records? Sure. Can the co company decide to give it its records? Yes. That's what's happening right now with a lot of the telecoms in the, in the telecommunication industry, cell phone records in particular, law enforcement will ask AT&T or Verizon, hey, um, we have a suspect who has this phone number, would you give us their location data for the last two weeks? And Verizon or AT&T or whoever is generally speaking, cooperating with law enforcement. Now, do they have to do that? No, they don't. Uh, could law enforcement go and get a warrant for that information? Yes, if they have probable cause. And so that hurdle of probable cause, that's a constitutional protection against unreasonable search and seizure. So corporations have that right. Corporations also have a very important right to freedom of speech. And this came up very recently in the case of FEC versus Wisconsin Right to Life in the Supreme Court. And Wisconsin Right to Life was saying, wait a minute, you, you go, the government put out these campaign finance reform laws that were intended to keep big corporations out of politics uh, and the special interest groups. You know, we heard a lot about these evil special interest groups. Well, if you look a little bit deeper and you think a little bit deeper, a special interest group is just a group that is made up of a lot of grassroots people that have a shared opinion about a particular topic. So a special interest group would be like a union, right? Uh, workers that say we work for this company or in this particular interest and so uh, in, uh, this particular industry. And so we want to make sure our rights are heard, our voices are heard in, in uh, Congress and the General Assembly of our state or whatever. So that special interest group lobbies for laws that are favorable to their members. And so 
Special interest groups are often formed as corporations. So for example, the National Rifle Association, the ACLU, uh, the Human Rights Coalition. Uh, these are on both sides of the political spectrum, right? Left and right. So uh, corporations were told under campaign finance laws that they were not allowed to buy airtime. They were not allowed to run commercial advertisements on television within a certain period of time of any election, state, national, federal, whatever. And so Wisconsin Right to Life said, wait a minute, we're going to run an advertisement that just says, we value life, we're here for you if you're a struggling uh, mother and you're, you're wrestling with what you should do, we wanna give you counseling and we'll give you free uh, support for you to have your baby if you so choose, and we just wanna help you. So we just want to run that advertisement and we want to run that advertisement on November 1st of the year of a general election. And campaign finance law said, I'm sorry, no, you can't run that because you're a corporation. Now, if you and I as individuals wanted to run a statement like that just to our neighborhood, right? Let's say you call up the local channel, you say, hey, I'd like to purchase a 30 second commercial and on it, I'm going to say, um, I care about you and I'd like to help you. Would there be any reason why you couldn't buy that airtime? Of course not, and they'd be glad to sell it to you. But if you were a corporation under campaign finance law, that law said you cannot do that within a certain number of days of a general election. You are influencing people's decisions. And they say, well, we're not even mentioning the election. We're not talking about the election. We're just saying, hey, people, we care about this issue and we want it to be thought about as you make decisions for life. Yes, including how you vote. Uh, so the only reason that campaign finance law drew a distinction between what you could do personally and what a special interest corporation could do is the fact that the corporation's rights were considered not to have free speech. Really, that was the argument that they were making. And uh, so that goes all the way to the Supreme Court and the Supreme Court says, wait a minute, we've already decided this several times. Corporations have the right to free speech. It's not derivative because it's individuals. It is personal to the corporations. They have that freedom of speech. So that whole section of the campaign finance law got done away with, got struck down as unconstitutional because it took the position that corporations don't have free speech rights. Now, understand this, because it's a very important and relevant current issue. Every year since that decision came out, that FEC versus Wisconsin right to life, uh, there are those in Congress that have proposed a constitutional amendment to undermine corporate free speech. And the amendment specifically says Corporations do not have the right to freedom of speech. That's it. Now, what's interesting, and this would maybe tell you which side of the political, political spectrum is uh, uh, approaching this, there are a ton of exceptions, and one of them is for labor unions. And I thought that was kind of interesting because a labor union is a prototypical special interest group. It's very much a special interest group. So this is kind of where we are, and right now, uh, there, this is very much an issue. I don't, th that particular constitutional amendment, I mean, between you and me and YouTube, it's not going to happen, okay? There just isn't enough public support for it, and it's a dumb idea, all right? Um, well, I guess I'm not supposed to editorialize, but there you go. So freedom of speech, uh, we have those uh, rights. Now, that, all that being said, I, I do point out here that only officers and directors have rights against self-incrimination. Their statements can incriminate the company. So if, um, if, if the undercover investigator is uh, investigating fraud in the company and he talks to someone other than officers and directors and they make statements that incriminate the company, later on we're gonna see a, com a, a concept called respondeat superior, which says, Everything that any employee does is attributed to the corporation. Well, unfortunately, when it comes to the Sixth Amendment right against self-incrimination and Fifth Amendment, uh, that does not apply in reverse. So the corporation's right not to incriminate itself only applies to statements by officers and directors. It does not apply to statements 
that might tend to incriminate a company that are made by lower level employees. So oftentimes in these RICO cases or in fraud cases against a corporation, uh, they will use the testimony of lower level employees in order to make their case. So that's what's going on with constitutional rights. Now, I mentioned it before, the greatest thing about corporate law uh, is the fact that corporations have limited liability. That means that the stockholders can't be sued. It means that the, the officers and directors and employees cannot be sued directly for uh, corporate liabilities. Now, there is, a, there is a sliver of opening there, okay? And it's called piercing the corporate veil. And it really happens in a couple of different situations. All right, let me give you two situations. The first situation where it happens is when the individual officer or director was personally involved in causing the liability. So if you're out driving a UPS truck and you cause a car accident and someone is injured, then that person that is injured sues UPS, right? Because respondeat superior, they're gonna see that yes, you are uh, liable as a company because your guy caused that accident. But they're not only gonna sue UPS, they're also gonna sue you personally. And that's allowed because you were involved in actually causing that problem. And the same goes for fraud, if it's a corporate officer, for intentional uh, infliction of uh, some sort of an injury and, and those kinds of things. The second way that they pierce the corporate veil is if the corporate veil is being used intentionally to hurt people in a way that there will be no remedy for them. So for example, we run a skydiving business, which we incorporate, and then we get no insurance, and we have no sort of risk mitigation measures in place. We're not following safety codes. We're just kind of getting taking people up in there and chucking them out of airplanes, all right? So somebody gets hurt, let's say, ultimately hurt, because there's not a lot of like in between. If your chute doesn't open, I'm sorry, you know, that life didn't turn out well for you. Um, and so your estate, right, or the estate of the person, I don't wanna make this personal, um, is going to sue the company, but, they're, but then the company is gonna say, well, we have no assets, so, and we have no insurance. And so what, the person is just out entirely? Well, the answer is no. Under those circumstances, a court is gonna let them, and here's the term, pierce the corporate veil. So the idea is that the corporation is a veil and you can't get through it, it's a shield, but we're gonna push that aside and allow that plaintiff to pierce the corporate veil because you were uninsured, engaged in risky activity, uh, or otherwise you know, manipulating it, treating it as your alter ego. These are all um, reasons why the corporate shield would actually not be effective in those cases, all right? Okay, so limited liability is the plus. What's the negative? Well, the negative is the corporate taxation. Now, you've often heard a ter the term that corporations are double taxed, right? And that's true because corporations are a person. And so, you know, it doesn't take the government very long to figure this out. They say, oh, if you're a person, then we can tax you, all right? So they do this to individuals. They also do this to corporations, and that's the double tax. So a corporation pays income tax, and then when its proceeds and profits are distributed to the shareholders through a process called dividends, then those dividends are also taxed. And so that's what we're talking about in terms of corporate uh, taxation. So yes, they are double taxed. They can be liable for their torts. If you remember, a tort is a personal injury, and under respondeat superior, uh, they are automatically liable for the personal injuries that are caused by an employee. Now, let's say the, the, the corporation says, well, wait, 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 wait. We have a policy that says UPS drivers are not allowed to cause car accidents. So does our policy get us off the hook? Because, hey, just because this employee was out there and caused an accident, yeah, but that broke our policy. And so we have, a, we have this policy, therefore we're not liable. No, a corporate policy not to injure people is not getting you off the hook for respondeat superior when your employees 
break the policy and actually go and hurt someone. And I get this all the time from clients and they wanna say, well, we shouldn't be liable for that. We told them not to. Now here's where it gets really bad. The worst of it is when the employee violates a policy and hurts themselves and then sues the company for their injuries. And you say, well, that can't be the case, is it? Yeah, it happens all the time. It's called worker's comp. It's a form of this. I saw this happen myself. One time uh, when I was working in the factory during summer, uh, the summers between my college semesters, um, I saw a person, we were not allowed to go anywhere in the factory where the yellow, outside the yellow lines. And in particular, these yellow lines were there to keep you away from the forklifts and the machinery and things. But this guy was running to break and he jumped over a pallet and you're never supposed to do that. He jumped outside the yellow lines over a pallet and his foot came down between the, the boards of the pallet and he twisted his ankle, maybe he broke it, I don't know, but it was a workplace injury. And so he definitely violated the policy. Does the company get off the hook for his injuries because he caused them himself when he violated the policy? No, the company is still pretty much automatically liable. And that goes for its own employees and also for customers or the general public that might be, enter, uh, might be injured. Okay, so what powers does a corporation have? Basically, the corporation has a lot of power. The corporation can enter into and engage in any business that is consistent with its purpose. And it is uh, going to be uh, limited only by the U.S. Constitution, state constitution, state statutes, its own articles of incorporation, its own corporate bylaws, and resolutions of its own board in that order, okay? Now, let me give you an example. Maranatha is a corporation, but Maranatha as a university is a limited corporation, and it's called a nonprofit corporation. So that see how state law limits our activities. We're also tax exempt. That's a federal consideration, and that limits the scope of our activity. So tax exemption at the federal level, nonprofit incorporation status at the state level, but we also have articles of incorporation that say Maranatha Baptist University exists to, and then it defines out some limiting things in our mission statement. So if I was to go to the Board of Trustees in May when we meet, and I was to say, listen, I got this great idea that we should open an amusement park. And they say, oh, well, okay, tell me more. And I say, well, if we would open an amusement park, and then we could sell tickets and people would come in and they would ride the rides and they would go, and they say, hey, 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 we know what an amusement park is. Get to the part where this is what Maranatha should do. Oh, well, we'll make a lot of money because people will come in and they'll pay tickets and they'll go on the rides. Oh, okay, but why would Maranatha, we're a ministry, right? We're a higher education institution. Why would we get into the amusement park business? Well, because we'll make a lot of money. And, and by the way, I've never heard anybody actually suggest an amusement park, but I have heard a lot of money-making ideas come across the desk about things Maranatha should do. Now, why do we say no to these great money-making opportunities? Because that's not within the scope of our articles of incorporation. So we don't have the power to get outside of that and just go do anything that would make money, all right? Because we're, we're a special purpose organization. So those are the limitations on corporate powers. Some of them are what we call express powers. That just means that they are specifically enumerated in our bylaws, in our articles of incorporation, but some of them are implied. And when we talk about implied powers, what we mean is if you were given an express responsibility that kind of outlined uh, in this way, then you are also considered to have been given authority to do anything else that is required to perform those explicitly given responsibilities. So you, you can do anything that you must do to reasonably accomplish the mission that you have. And that includes things like borrowing money, extending credit, making charitable contributions, which by the way, can be somewhat controversial. I remember studying this when I was in college and Mr. Fafi was talking to us in uh, corporate finance and we were talking about what you could do with your profits. And one of the things that we talked about was, can a for-profit company make charitable contributions? I mean, think about it. We're supposed to be maximizing shareholder profit. What could be more opposed 
to shareholder profit than just giving our money away, right? I mean, that is the very definition of not making a profit. <laughs> so how is it consistent with our profit-making motive to give the money away in charitable contribution? So the, the long story short version of that is that you can do it to a limited extent. You can't give away all of your money and, and all of your profits, but you can make a certain amount of reasonable charitable contributions because it has, it's seen as the, being the good corporate citizen, it's seen as PR, it's seen as uh, good community relations. And so that's why you see things. When, you, when I go to Walmart, uh, you know, many years ago, back when you could go to you know, stores just willy-nilly, just get out of your car and go into a store. You didn't have to think about getting a virus. Um, on the bulletin board in the front, it would say $30,000 given by this store to the Watertown Park System. All right, why did they do that? Because they care about the Watertown Park System? Well, I would submit to you, no, they do not care about the Watertown Park system. What they care about is the idea that the community sees Walmart as a net positive thing, and they don't pay attention to the fact that the entire downtown merchandise uh, uh, community has been wiped out completely ever since Walmart came to town, right? So that's really what that's all about. You say, Dr. Davis, that's a very cynical way to look at it. I'm sorry, you can call it cynical, I call it realistic okay all right so those are the implied powers now how can we classify corporations well we classify them lots and lots of different ways we look we can look at them as domestic foreign or alien now i'm going to do it to you again here we go business law taking a normal word giving it a different meaning domestic means operating in the state where it is incorporated okay so if your corporation is incorporated in the state of Wisconsin, then you are in the state of Wisconsin. For that purpose, you are domestic, okay? Remember, corporation law is state-centered. So all of these terms, domestic, foreign, and alien, are state-centered, not nationally-centered, where we normally use these words. That means that a foreign corporation is not a Canadian corporation. A foreign corporation is a corporation that is, that is uh, organized outside of the state in which it is operating. So a Minnesota corporation that has a Wisconsin office with regard to the state of Wisconsin is a foreign corporation. You say, okay, well then what is a Canadian company? Are they also foreign? No, they are alien, right? So we have to go intergalactic at that point. So a, a foreign country you're incorporated in Canada or China or wherever, and you're gonna do business into the United States, then at that level, you are called an alien corporation. All right, so domestic in your state, foreign from another state, alien from another country. So those are ways that we can classify corporations. Another way we can classify them, as I've alluded to, public and private, nonprofit, or close corporations. Now, I've talked about public corporations, those have shareholders. I've talked about nonprofit corporations, that's like Maranatha, but let's talk about close corporations for just a minute. Hobby Lobby is a good example of a close corporation. Even though it's a big company with a lot of stores and millions of dollars in profit, at least until recently, um, it is a close corporation, meaning that it is owned by a very small number of people, generally people from the same family or the same community. And so they are a very small number of shares, maybe a hundred or less shares. That's going to be considered a close corporation. Now, why that's important is that Hobby Lobby recently found itself also in the Supreme Court over this issue of health insurance and Obamacare. And one of the things that they were saying was, wait a minute, we are a closely held corporation and this violates our religious beliefs. Ooh, there's an interesting one. Amongst the constitutional rights, that corporations have, do they have religious rights? Well, the Supreme Court said in the Hobby Lobby case that Hobby Lobby did have religious liberty rights because they are a closely held corporation. And a lot of people missed that point, and that's one of the reasons why that ruling isn't quite as great as it could have been, uh, because it kind of has a narrow focus, doesn't it? If the only reason they let Hobby Lobby do that is because 
they are a close corporation, then I guess that really doesn't extend those rights as, as generally as maybe we had all kind of hoped. And so uh, that's what's going on with a close corporation. It's got informal management. The shareholders generally are running the business. And uh, you can even have restrictions on who they can share, uh, sell their shares to. And you can say, wait a minute, any sale of the shares has to be approved by the remainder, a majority of the remainder shareholders. All right, so uh, an S corporation, some states have these, it limits your number of shareholders to 75. In Illinois, I think it's 150. Um, and, and those are out there. They have um, a little bit of the benefit of like an LLC, if you'll remember back to our business entities. An S corporation is a little bit next level from an LLC. It's an S designation that you put on your corporate status with the IRS, and it avoids the double taxation problem. Then there's a possibility for professional corporations in uh, some states, lawyers, doctors, engineers, accountants, when they make a corporation, they have to give it a professional corporation designation. So maybe it's PA for a professional association, or maybe it's SC for service corporation. And the idea is we're just telling people in general, yes, we are an engineering firm or a law firm, but we are also organized as a corporation, not a partnership. So it just gives the public a little bit of a heads up. All right, procedures. Let's talk about procedures for just a little bit. Uh, first of all, uh, you're going to be um, filing these with the Secretary of State, except in the state of Wisconsin, where for whatever reason, we don't like our Secretary of State. Uh, we give all this business to the Department of Financial Institutions. Again, I don't know why, there's gotta be a story there, but uh, for, for Wisconsin, it's the Department of Financial Institutions for pretty much everyone else in the world. You file articles with the Secretary of State. When you do that, you're gonna have some bylaws that provide for your internal organization. You're gonna to have to specify a registered office and a registered agent. Uh, you're going to have a certain number of incorporators. These are usually the people that organized the corporation. So somebody had the idea to start this corporation and that somebody gets a special title. They're called the Promoter. Now, anytime I hear about promoters, I always think about Don King and boxing, you know, like this guy with the big hair and, you know, he was out making crazy claims about his boxers, how great they were. And that's kind of what we have in mind with corporations. They're going around before the thing is even filed and they're telling potential investors how great this company is going to be and you should invest and it's going to be awesome. And uh, that's the promoter. Once you get to the line of filing the articles of incorporation, now the company is chartered and the promoters change titles. They're now considered incorporators, okay? So that's all it is. It's the same people. They were promoters before the filing. Now they're incorporators after the filing. Okay, directors and officers. Uh, every corporation is governed by a board of directors. In a nonprofit, sometimes they're called a board of trustees. People have asked me, what's the difference between directors and trustees? The answer is there is no difference, all right? In, the, in terms of corporate governance, governance, there is no difference. Now, the one thing I wanna point out about this, and then I'm not gonna really get down into the weeds of all of what it means to be a director. Um, directors of a corporation do not have individual authority to act on their own, okay? They are not allowed to go out and tell the employees what to do. They're not allowed to tell the officers what to do. Their only ability is to act as a group, right? So they, they only can have any kind of authority when they are passing resolutions or voting on corporate matters at the board level. Now, you'd be foolish not to pay attention to the directors, right? And if they have an opinion that they want to share or an idea, well, then you want to listen to that but they don't have individual rights to tell the officers and the employees what to do. And every once in a while this comes up in a church or a Christian school that I will deal with, and they have this one rogue school board member who's out telling teachers about how they ought to set up their curriculum and telling them about what books to buy, and the teacher is really kind of confused by that. Why? Because this director is way outside the chain of command. They're skipping the officers, and they're coming down, and they're getting directly to an employee telling them what to do. And, and you know, it's a gentle and very diplomatic process, but you kind of have to say to these directors, hey, 
Your job is up here, policy, direction, vision, general things like appointing the officers, and then you need to back off and let them do their job. So the day-to-day -day running of the corporation is done by the corporate officers. So the president, generally, like at Maranatha, the board only hires one person, the president. And then the president has the authority to set up a system for how everybody else gets hired. Now, the board doesn't like somebody you hired. What can they do? Well, they can remove the president. So yes, you're gonna listen to the board, but it's the officers that actually run the day-to-day -day, uh, running and operations of the institution. So generally they're employed, uh, they have employment contracts that govern their salaries and benefits and things like that but they can be terminated by the board and they serve at the pleasure of the board. So the board can terminate them for cause and in a lot of cases, not for cause, right? They just feel like we wanna go in a different direction. Okay, so at this point, I'm gonna skip a little bit in terms of duties and liabilities of directors and officers. I think that's pretty self-explanatory. And I wanna talk a little bit about conflict of interest, conflict of interest. Now I've mentioned this before, but I, I really think it bears um, some repeating. We talked about this a little bit in the ethics chapter. If you go back and think all the way back to years ago when we started this semester, um, and we talked about conflict of interest. If a board member or an officer has a financial stake or a personal stake in a decision that is under consideration officially, then they must fully disclose it and they must not participate in the voting on that particular item. Now, if full disclosure and non-participation, the institution decides to go through with the contract in favor of this person who has the conflict. That's fine as long as the contract was in the best interest of the corporation. So again, if you're giving a break to the company and you're giving them a better price, then why wouldn't we want to go with the person who has their heart set on helping this corporation. So it doesn't mean you can never go through with those transactions. It just says the process for approval has to be full disclosure and non-participation of the conflicted officer. Uh, this is an important one, the business judgment rule, okay? Uh, I'm gonna put a star by this one, okay? This is the thing you need to remember uh, from the chapter, okay, not just for a test, but for your life, okay? This is, you're gonna need this someday, so file this away, all right? The business judgment rule says that officers and directors cannot be sued for judgment calls that they had to make in their capacity, even if those judgment calls turn out to, to be, in hindsight, stupid or wrong, or put in, a, I guess, a better way, um, turn out to be not the best decision and lost the company money or whatever, okay? So if you did your best to make a good decision and it turned out not to be the right decision, it was wrong, and even you agree after the fact, you know what, that was the wrong decision. As long as you operated in good faith and did the best that you can, you have a form of immunity from being personally sued for your, your lapse in business judgment, okay? That's the business judgment rule. So I use the term good faith or did your best. What does that really mean? Well, under the business judgment rule, it says, number one, you were reasonably informed, okay? That's really critical. So reasonably informed means, you know, turns out that was a bad decision, but I did bring in as many experts as I could under the time constraints, under the expense restraints that we had, and I really tried to learn everything I could to make the best decision, but we just didn't have enough information at that time. Now that all the information is out, and now that we look back, we realize, oops, that was a mistake. But at the time, we only had the information we had. It was the best information we had. We had experts, we got everybody involved, and this, we thought, was the best thing to do. 
If, if that's the process you engaged with, then you will win if someone sues you for that mistake. But that points out another important angle on this. It's not just that you were reasonably well informed. It's that you can document what you knew at that time because everything always looks different in hindsight. And 10 years later, when we have the benefit of you know, commissions and fact-finding you know, experts and everything else, well, sure, and all the time in the world to make the decision, it might look a little bit different. This whole COVID-19 thing is gonna look different two years from now when all the data is analyzed and the academics get in and they look at it and we go, hmm, turns out that's what we were really dealing with. But right now, we don't have all those facts, right? So it's not only important to be reasonably informed and make a good faith decision in the best interest of the company, but we also need to be able to document. And I feel like the one thing that's really missing in business grads in particular, people without legal training, is an appreciation for the importance of documenting everything. It's super critical to your defense later on. I, I always say it this way. It's not good enough to do the right thing. It's just not. You have to do the right thing in a way that you can prove that you did the right thing. And that can be a lot harder, okay? So it takes more time, it takes some thought, but you need to document. And this is one of those avenues where if you'll do it, you get a nice level of protection for doing so, all right? So you gotta have the best information, document the information you had in your process for making the decision and make that in the best interest of the company. All right. Okay. Um, number next, I'm going to skip the talk about shareholder rights. I don't think it's necessary for us to talk too much about that other than two things. All right. Number one, preemptive rights. And then number two, we'll talk a little bit about dividends. Okay. All right. Preemptive rights. When you own shares of a company, especially if you own a lot of shares in a company, you get to appoint a director or two to the board. And the number of directors that you get to appoint is based on the percentage of your ownership. And so one of the ways that corporations try to deal with shareholders that they are tired of dealing with and their directors, especially minority shareholders, is by diluting the percentage of ownership that they have. And so if you have a thousand shares outstanding and this problem shareholder who owns 300 shares, okay? How are we gonna diminish this guy? Because right now, if we have 10 board members, he's appointing three of them. And those three board members are just making life difficult for everybody. So we wanna get rid of this guy. How are we gonna do it? Well, we could buy him out, but we don't wanna buy him out. Instead, let's do this. Let's just issue a thousand more shares. And by doing a thousand more shares, this guy's interest will go from having a third of our ownership or 30% of ownership down to 15% of ownership. Now he's only able to appoint one trustee. And then somebody says, well, if we can do a thousand, why not 10,000? Let's issue a hundred thousand, right? And so you can dilute a person's percentage of ownership by just issuing more stock. Well, preemptive rights, the states came in and said, no, 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 you can't play this game. When you issue new stock, you must give all of the existing shareholders the first option to buy as many shares as is necessary to maintain their current percentage of ownership, okay? So if it's a, a, a thousand new shares on a thousand shares of stock, you got to give them the right to buy 300 more of the new shares, which will preserve now have 600 out of 2000, same 30%, okay? So those are provided by state law. They're generally also reflected in articles of incorporation. And if we didn't have that, we could really have a major problem uh, with corporate ownership and the rights of those shareholders, especially minor minority shareholders, okay? Uh, dividends. What is a dividend? Well, the, the board of trustees votes to pay the profits of the company out based on the number of shares that you hold. And so these are ordered by the board of trustees, board of directors, 
Uh, they can be issued in the form of cash, in the form of additional stock or property, or even stock in other corporations. And there are even some state laws that say what sources of revenue you can use to pay dividends from. And so you want to pay attention uh, to those as well. All right, what else? Well, let's talk about how companies can combine, okay? How do they combine? Well, one of the ways that corporations grow is by absorbing other corporations. And so there are really four options that, that I put out here, okay? Number one is a merger. Number two, very similar, is a consolidation. Number three is we just buy all their assets. And number four is we purchase a controlling interest in uh, their stock. So we just kind of do a hostile takeover and we purchase all of their stock. So let's look at each of those four uh, one at a time. No, first, let's look at the merger possibility, all right? A merger is the legal combination of two companies and they are generally, uh, one company is much bigger and much stronger than the other company. Maybe you have somebody like Google who's going to acquire an app that has a useful feature or a portfolio of patents, software patents that Google is interested in. And so at that point, they would call it a merger and Google would absorb the app. And the company that comes out of it is the bigger, stronger company. So Google doesn't change its name or its logo just because it acquired the, uh, the company that it merged with. After the merger, A is what we call the surviving corporation. And so we would do an article of merger and we would show that everything from this company just absorbed into the other company, all of its employees, all of its assets, and all of its liabilities, including liabilities that we don't even know about right now. So there's this lawsuit that's about to be filed against company B. Guess what? They just strike out company B, write in company A, and keep up with the lawsuit. So it has a plus in that you're absorbing everything, all the talent, all the, all the uh, intellectual property, all the rights, but there's a downside because you are also absorbing the liabilities. What's the second option? Consolidation. This occurs when you have, again, two companies, but this time they are relatively the same size and the same strength. And instead of having a surviving company, we actually are going to consolidate the two together and the two together are going to have a new name, a completely different name. So we have A and B getting together to form C. All right. So that's a consolidation. And again, this wouldn't be Google and some app. This would be if, you, if Google and Microsoft, now the, the government would never let this happen, but if, if Google and Microsoft were going to combine, well, which one's the, the big one? <laughs> They're both the big one, right? And so uh, we wouldn't call that a merger. We'd call that a consolidation. They have to come up with a new name altogether, and maybe you have some suggestions for what the new name should be, Google Soft or something like that. Mm. No, that probably doesn't sound good. All right, the, fourth, the third option is purchase of assets. This is very simple. The problem we have with mergers and consolidations is that we're carrying forward the liabilities of those other companies. What if we just wanted the assets, but we didn't want any of the liabilities? How could we do that? Well, in this case, you have A and B. A files articles of disillusion they're going out of business completely and sells all of their assets to company B, which is just going to continue on as is. This is something I've done a number of times with churches. And you have church A, which has a building. Uh, it's beautiful. This happened in uh, Florida. My church was in Pinellas Park and two blocks away was a Bible church that had a beautiful building that could seat 600 people and they had... 11 senior citizens and no pastor meeting in that entire complex. Thing was paid off, but they couldn't afford the utilities. They couldn't afford even just the basic upkeep and they were really struggling. Our church was growing, a young pastor, very energetic, three services every Sunday to pack out our tiny little church building. So we got together with the elders of this Bible church and we said, you know, there would be a way for this facility to continue to be used of God and ministry, 
uh, at even a greater uh, pace than what you see today. Wouldn't it be wonderful if this was full and you had young families and a vibrant pastor and you know really outgoing ministry? And wouldn't it be great to see those days again? And so through the course of time, it took a long time, uh, we negotiated where that Bible church actually dissolved, donated in that case, since it was a nonprofit, all of its assets, including the church facility, to my church, and we moved all of our operations into that facility. So within about a year, it went from 11 people rattling around in a musty old building to our church, 450 people in there, uh, spent a couple hundred thousand dollars in renovations and upgrades and just the basic upkeep that had been ignored. So it was a wonderful result, but here was the problem. Uh, most of us at Christian Law Association went to this church, right? So they had a bunch of lawyers in the church, and we were all thinking the same thing. That Bible church has been around for a long time. I don't know if they've got li liabilities sitting out there. I don't know if people are going to sue them or whatever. I don't want our church to take on those liabilities. How could we structure this in a way that we don't get the liabilities, but we do get the assets? And that's why we came up with the structure that we did. When you do a purchase of assets, generally, and again, state law can be specific about this, but generally you are not liable for any unknown liabilities of that organization. Now you can't do it as a fraud, you know, to try to get out from a known liability, but in general, in a case like the one I just described, uh, it worked wonderfully. And you know what, it was great. Those 11 people actually joined our church they became uh, members in our church, and it was actually a wonderful result. Okay, uh, and we did actually change our name. We were Community Baptist Church. We changed it to Community Bible Baptist Church, to just kind of bring in the name uh, of the other church as well. Option number four for companies to get together is the purchase of stock. This is sometimes called a hostile takeover. Uh, there are movies made about this, and what do you do? Well, you secretly, or not so secretly, just go about buying up massive amounts of this company's stock until you get to 51%, right? Once you get to 51%, you now have what's called a controlling interest. It means you can elect a majority of the board of directors, which will then fire all of the current officers and take the company in the direction that you want them to go. Sometimes this happens in a pretty nasty fight. Uh, because the hostile takeover is being done by some kind of a hedge fund uh, that is just looking for um, assets to carve up and sell off and they don't care at all about continuing the business, which means the employees of that company are all getting laid off. And so it's, it, it tends to have a negative connotation to it, but in general, it's just a tactic that's used uh, for companies to, uh, to merge together. All right, so that's how they can get together. Our final question is, how can they die, right? Where do corporations go to die? Well, uh, basically, the termination of a company is done by filing articles of disillusion. Once you file articles of disillusion with the Secretary of State or the Department of Financial Institutions, if you happen to be in Wisconsin, uh, then your articles of disillusion will set out the process in order. And that process is called liquidation liquidation. And so what happens here is in the liquidation, you are going to list out all of the people you owe money to, your creditors, all of the people that owe you money, your, your uh, people that owe you money, your receivables, and all of your assets, which you're then going to go about and sell. So you combine all these things together. It's basically like a probate if you think about someone dying individually. And you pay off the creditors by selling the assets and then if there is any money left, you have to certify this to the state. If there's any money left, it goes to the shareholders and they get paid off for their shares. All right, so that's what's going on with corporations. All right, uh, in a nutshell, we've talked about corporations, how they're formed, what kinds of rights they have, how they can merge together and where they go to die. I hope this has been a good informative thing for you. And uh, now you can do your articles and have your discussion online, and uh, we will see you later. Have a great day.